or in Buddhism we say it could ripen many a long, long time from now. So even generations from now it could ripen. Like we have one resident who was going through his dead grandfather's closet and found some essentially meditation tapes and was interested in them and learned meditation from them when he was still very young. And that got him started on the meditation path. So there's somebody who was already dead, but whose actions had bore fruit uh, later in a, in a grandson. So we have to be aware that our thoughts and what we attend to with our mind, our speech, and how we frame our speech, how we speak or don't speak, and our actions have effects that start a chain reaction that can keep on going forever and ever and ever. And then more importantly, they have an effect on us. What we think, what we attend to with our mind, what we say, and what we do has an effect in, in molding us, changing us. So I just, um, we have a, a Zen teacher's list, or several of them. And I was a little surprised reading a recent message from a Zen teacher uh, who isn't in this country, but has, has practiced and taught in this country. And there are these typical email conversations which get uh, a little excited easily. Right? So one teacher was right, they were, the whole discussion was about women training in Japan and people's experience, especially the women who had trained in Japan, what their experience was. And one woman wrote something innocuous. <coughs> You know, it's always these things that seem innocuous that blow up. And she she wrote, um, when when the old when I was training in Japan in the temple, when the old Roshi was away, the younger monks, re realizing that I was senior, because seniority depends on when you were ordained. Even though as a woman they knew I was senior, so when the old teacher was away, they would give me the quotes with a big smile, and then I would I would lead the ceremony. So this other Zen teacher wrote in and said. What the F, dot, 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 is a quotes, K-O-T-S-U. So that, that's very interesting. A quotes is the stick that we sometimes carry, the teaching stick that we sometimes carry when we do service or when we're teaching. And it's a personal stick that a teacher carries and it kind of takes on their, their energy. But what was interesting is that he was, he was swearing about something completely innocuous. She just made a statement. He didn't understand what the word was. So there was a completely unnecessary to use a cuss word, and I was quite surprised. So obviously that's not a part of what we would consider right speech, right, to respond in that way, because what will it do? A little provoked reaction if not from her, I mean, a provoked reaction from me, I wrote back and said, you know, this is not right speech, I don't think you need to use a cuss word on, on the listserv. Um, but it points back to him, right? It points back to what's going on in him. Why would he use a word like that? So why do we use cuss words? I'm asking. <laughs> Maybe you can't answer yet. To make a point. To make a point. Emphasis. For emphasis. To get attention. To get attention. To let out anger. To let out anger. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how to better express ourselves. We don't know how to better express ourselves. So we don't have the vocabulary, a, a better vocabulary. Insult and injure. Uh huh. To insult and injure, to provoke and insult and injure someone. Mm -hmm. Insecurity. Mm -hmm. Insecurity. So it, it indicates when somebody cusses, it indicates an underlying energy, usually of irritation, anger, or the desire to hurt someone. Right. So you use the words in a hurtful way. So it indicates a not wholesome state of mind. It's not. Um, it's not used when we're happy. Uh, usually. Uh, these days, the F word, though, is like sprinkled in like salt and pepper and uh, food. But uh, usually it's said, it's said with extra power and extra energy, and there's, it, it tends to get a reaction. So he was irritated that he didn't understand her word, I guess, her Japanese word. And so he reacted in that way. It's very, very interesting. So it's intended to provoke some kind of reaction. And it will. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more coming back on the listserv about about just f dot dot dot. Uh, so it'll the, it'll be a chain that will will grow and then hopefully die out eventually. Some people will be reactive. Some people will be distressed. Some people will ignore it. 
then he'll react back and people react and so on. And, you know, just like ping pong game, he keeps going. All over one word. Isn't that interesting? That's how our mind works. We have to know how our mind works. So if I said yutz, does that bother you? Not right now. Not right now. <laughs> if I said dupek, does that bother you? If I said yom, <coughs> or if I said kuso, ah, I know what that means. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> one person knew what it meant. And some people might have known what some of the other words meant, but they were swear words in Yiddish and Polish and Russian and Japanese. But if you don't know what they mean, they have no effect on you, right? So they're just sounds. And we really take them apart, it's just a sound. But we've picked certain sounds in our language to convey anger, irritation, insult. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's just a sound. It's just ta da. Chin chin. Which actually is a swear word in Japanese. It's just sound. But the mind stream coalesces around it and then we react to it. And if you're around people who cuss a lot, you know what happens? You end up cussing, right? You have those words in your mind, and then you end up, eventually, they come out of your mouth. And then somebody else picks it up, and on it goes. First they're in your mind, then they're coming out of your mouth. So I was thinking of what to say to the people who are leaving for the, the end of the summer, and one thing is that good company is the most important supportive practice. Good company is the most important support for your practice. So always seek good company. People who all also always have who all who also have a spiritual underpinning for their life. It doesn't have to be Buddhist, but that this is a concern of theirs. And part of their part of their life that is dedicated to spiritual practice, religious uh, activities. And particularly practice, not just empty activities, but practice that looks within and, and works to change me. People in recovery, of course, know that good company is the most important part of their practice. So um, this is the last of the summer program, and so what I'm going to say is often what we say at the end of a long retreat, and that is our state of mind and our circumstances are not two different things. So if we're in a, a particular place, like this, this monastery, where so many people's practices are aligned and so many people are emphasizing uh, stillness and presence, of course our mind takes on an element of that. Our body feels more serene because of the environment that we're in. And when we leave and change to a different environment, we can't expect the same state of mind that we've carried for these last couple of months or for a week of retreat. It's going to change. It's going to be different. So everywhere we go, different things are brought forth. And of course, as Chosen mentioned, if we go to wholesome places, places of suitable kinds, then, as the Mangala Sutta says, then, of course, our state of mind, that, that which is brightest and best in us, begins to come forth. The other side of that, of course, is we have the ability to choose. We have the ability to choose where we're going to go. We have the ability to choose what's important to us, what we're thinking about. So the ability to take one's practice and to keep thinking what is most true here, what's most important, or to take one's practice wherever one goes with a loving heart and practice loving kindness, then we also affect our environment. 